Hello, thank you for joining me in this session uh, on database cloning on Exadata, specifically database cloning for development and test. I'm going to be talking today about a couple of features in particular, Exadata sparse cloning and the ACFS snapshot technologies, but we will touch on a few other bits and pieces as well uh, along the way. Who am I? My name is Alex Blythe. I'm a product manager and I'm part of the Exadata Core product management team uh, working in the mission critical database development organization, specifically on the Exadata Core platform. Uh, Mission Critical Database Development uh, covers not just the Exadata platform itself, but also includes technologies like Real Application Clusters, Oracle Active Data Guard and Data Guard, uh, Golden Gate, uh, a whole bunch of transaction management. Yeah, lots and lots of the internals that uh, Mission Critical Databases, in fact, all Oracle databases ultimately leverage uh, in the real world out there. And several ways you can get in contact with me. Uh, you can get in contact with me through Twitter or through LinkedIn. Uh, myself, Gavin Parrish, Seth Miller, we also monitor to twitter.com slash exadatapm. Uh, so you can reach out to uh, all three of us uh, in that regard, or sorry, sorry, through that channel if you want to as well. Uh, and the other way to just keep an eye on what we're all up to is by keeping on blogs.oracle.com slash exadata. Uh, that blog site is being maintained on a very regular basis. Uh, with more and more information uh, being posted all the time on all matters uh, Exadata. So, let's jump into why we're here. Exadata sparse clones and the ACFS snapshot technologies, and in particular, what database cloning is and why you might do it. So, let's jump straight into it. Let's ask this fundamental question. What's a database clone or a snapshot? Hard to not use the word clone in answering this, uh, this same question, but a database clone or a snapshot is a copy or a duplicate of an existing database. It's that simple. Nothing more, uh, you know, more deep than that, nothing more esoterical than that. It is a copy or a duplicate of an existing database. So why do we create database clones or snapshots? Well, many of you are probably already doing this in your organizations today. You're using these clones or snapshots for development, for test, performance testing, system integration, pre-production, production support, potentially even some uh, offline, non-production style reporting. There's a whole range of different reasons why you might create database clones or snapshots. But hang on, my database is really big, it's huge. You know, and huge is obviously a relative term, but you know, it, is, uh, it is what it is. It's a big database, I have finite amount of storage. What does that mean if I'm doing copies of databases in my uh, in my environment, in particular on Exadata. Well, that's a fair point. Big databases take a lot of uh, a lot of space, so you probably don't want what I'm going to start referring to as a fully materialized clone. So I'm starting to allude to this idea that probably what you want is a thinly provisioned or space efficient sparse clone or snapshot of your database, something that isn't going to represent the entirety of that database from a space consumption perspective, but is representing the entire database, whether that's a half terabyte database, whether it's a 70 terabyte database or anywhere in between, or even bigger obviously than that, but some sort of uh, fully, um, sorry, thinly provisioned or semi-materialized representation of your database that for all intents and purposes looks like the entirety of its source uh, or its, uh, you know, its source database. So what about PDBs? They're a type of database as well. The good news here is that PDBs are clonable. We're going to talk about a couple of different uh, features along the way with this. And the nice thing about the multi-tenant architecture or pluggable databases, PDBs, uh, is they add some extra flexibility to the technology options. And Oracle has always been and continues to be about choice. Exadata on-premises, Exadata cloud customer, Exadata cloud service, Exadata uh, underpinning the autonomous database platform are different deployment choices. In each of these, there are different ways of doing database clones and PDBs enable us to do different types of cloning, but are also complementary to the techniques that we're gonna talk about today or the technologies we're gonna talk, uh, talk about today. Which is a nice segue into this question. So what's available on the Exadata platform to make database clients. There's a number of different technologies. We're specifically going to be talking today about Exadata sparse cloning and ACFS snapshot on Exadata. Now these 
two different ways of doing database clones or snapshots. I'm going to use those phrases inter uh, interchangeably to some extent. Um, a ways of, of, of creating thin provisioned or space efficient database clones on the Exadata platform. But just be aware they work in, in, in slightly uh, different ways. Exadata sparse clone is what's called an allocate on first right technology. I mean that we have a, uh, a fully instantiated parent of that database. Now that fully instantiated parent uh, or source needs to be read only. I have to have somewhere that I'm always going to be able to refer back to to get any block that may not be in the thinly provisioned database that we're going to create along the way. The sparse clones only contain the change blocks and those blocks accumulate, they're copied from the test parent to the, uh, to the clone as changes are made in the clone itself. So we have uh, this mechanism to bring across that copy of the data uh, of a block, that copy of the data, from the parent to the clone uh, as changes happen in the clone itself. ACFS, on the other hand, is a copy on write technology, and it operates at the file system level as opposed to the ASM level, which I didn't mention around Exadata sparse clone. But there's, uh, you know, we'll get into some detail on that in a minute. The ACFS snapshot, though, uh, enables parents to be read write. They preserve the older blocks as they're being changed in the, uh, in the parent, in the source database, and are copied across into the snapshot uh, as those changes happen at the parent. And that's because it, you know, we, we enable that read-write uh, read parent uh, functionality. Now, there's some differences between the two technologies, the two, uh, you know, the two ways that snapshots can be done, and they're important to understand. And we'll go into a bit of detail about both of those uh, in a few slides time. But these are the two technologies we're going to uh, specifically be focusing on in today's session. So let's just dig into these a little bit uh, from a, uh, a slightly more conceptual um, uh, perspective. Uh, on the right hand side, you'll see a representation of an Exadata platform. So you can see two database servers, dbserve1, dbserve2. Uh, I've got three disk groups, data c1, rico c1, and sparse c1. I'll explain what sparse c1 is in just a second. Uh, and at the moment, I have two instances, FDB1 and FDB2, pointing to my FDB database, my full database. Now, this is a regular Oracle database, nothing special about it. It's just a regular read-write database. Exadata uh, sparse clones, or snapshots, are a native, feature of, uh, a native feature of Oracle Exadata. And what they do is they use a, a, a special grid disk underneath that sparse disk group I talked about, SPRC1. Uh, Obviously, that name can change a little bit if you want to. Uh, but it is a way of Exadata understanding that blocks being written to that are going to have a parent associated with them. The file that they're being written to is going to have a parent. And that invokes extra code or special code inside the Exadata storage platform to enable, uh, to enable this sparse or this thin provisioned space efficient cloning to be uh, to be possible inside the Exadata platform. And this is all completely transparent to the uh, to the database uh, above it. Uh, the sparse database files, I, I mentioned this really briefly a second ago, they point to a parent data file. So there is always going to be some parent, uh, you know, at the end of, um, probably call it a chain here, at the end of a chain or at the end of a hierarchy uh, that is always going to be potentially referred back to. But the key word that I've just said there is hierarchical. I can create a hierarchy of clones, a clone of a clone of a clone of a clone, if I need to. Uh, I've mentioned they're space efficient. They only contain the change blocks in the clone itself. Uh, and they are allocated as that data is being changed in the clone. We'll copy the block and only the blocks that are being changed from the source, the read-only source, and copy them into the sparse database and manipulate them uh, in, that, uh, in that database as we go along. And then any I.O. that needs to be um, redirected for unmaterialized blocks, that is blocks that haven't been copied from the parent to the clone, uh, that I.O. redirection happens underneath the covers. There's nothing extra that you need to do apart from make sure that you create the clone in the right way. And I'll show you a, sh a short demo uh, towards the end of the session on how that, uh, how that occurs. So there's our sparse database. Uh, now I've got extra instances, SDB1, SDB2. 
uh, I now have a sparse database. These are slightly transparent in color so that you can see that they are sparse. They're not fully materialized databases. The instances are fully functioning instances, but the database itself is a space efficient database. And it points back to that FDB database on the data disk group that you can see there. Now I'm just gonna make all of these a little bit more transparent so that we can now talk about ACFS. So ACFS is, hopefully as you're aware, a feature of ASM, it's the, the, the ASM cluster file system. And it has a feature, it's a POSIX compliant platform, uh, has many features, one of which is snapshotting. And you can see here that you can obviously do replicating, tagging, encryption, compression. Now be aware that on the Exadata platform, snapshots are the only features supported for database files. Compression, encryption, replication, all of these kind of features are for file system replication or encryption and compression not for database data files. Our recommendation has been and will continue to be to use database aware technologies, Oracle Advanced Compression, Oracle Transparent Data Encryption, Oracle Data Guard, to do features like replication, encryption and compression because they are database aware, because they understand how an Oracle block is structured. So the difference here is that the uh, ACFS file system snapshots operate at the file system level. That's kind of the giveaway in the, in the title there. Uh, but they operate at the file system level. And they are a copy on write uh, technology so that we're always copying data from the source into the snapshot as data changes in the source itself. So you need to be aware of those different, uh, different uh, caveats. Now, the one thing that you need to be aware of right out of the gate here is for an ACFS file system snapshot to be possible, the database needs to live inside an ACFS mount point. It has to live on ACFS, otherwise it's not gonna be able to make use of the ACFS uh, file system snapshot capability. So in this, uh, this part of the diagram, you can see now I've got uh, ACFS DB1 and ACFS DB2 pointing to a fully materialized, a regular Oracle database, ACFS DB. And if we extend uh, our diagram out just a little bit further, we can create a file system snapshot that's called slash ACFS underscore S1 for snapshot one. Uh, and I've now created two extra instances, instances there, ACFS DBS lowercase s there, just to uh, hopefully make it a little easy that it's, uh, or to indicate that it's a, a, a snapshot. Uh, one two and one one. Um, my name in there obviously has started to get away with me, but anyway, hopefully you get the, uh, you get the idea. So are there other options? I, I kind of already answered my own question before, but I'm just gonna reiterate really quickly. Yes, there are other options. Sparse snapshots and ACFS snapshots are two ways to create space efficient snapshots on the Exadata platform. And as we'll see in a little bit, uh, Exadata sparse clones also enable all of the Exadata platform performance options, or features rather, uh, whereas ACFS works slightly differently. So you need to understand the difference between of them uh, between the two so that you can work out which is the most appropriate uh, choice for your database cloning requirements. Other options that you're probably already using today are things like ARMAN duplicate, uh, PDB hot cloning, uh, data pump export import. All of these are good options and I'm sure there's other ways of doing it. These are just the ones that I uh, put together quickly. Uh, all of these are good options if you require a fully materialized copy of your database, a full clone. So if you have a 70 terabyte database and you need a 70 terabyte database, every single block written down to disk, these are great ways of going about doing that. But if you have a 70 terabyte database, but you only want it to use as little space as possible when you're doing the clone, because you might need 10, 15, 30 of these, you, know, you don't want to have 30 uh, times 70 terabyte databases on your platform that may not be the most efficient, uh, space efficient way of operating your Exadata platform. So pick and choose which is the most uh, optimal for the use case at hand uh, and for the, the refresh requirements that, uh, that you have as well. Let's dig into Exadata sparse clones a little bit, um, just so that you understand a bit more about those. We'll then talk about ACFS snapshots, a little bit of a demo, uh, and we'll, we'll uh, also talk about uh, some PDBs uh, PDB cloning uh, towards the very end. Just jumping into some of the detail here on Exadata Sparse Clones. As I've said a few times now, Exadata Sparse Clones are an integral part of the Exadata platform. They are part of the Exadata system software 
And the upshot of that is that they therefore enable all of the Exadata storage features. Things like SQL offload, IO prioritization, quarantine, um, rebalance, all of these features, uh, storage indexes, hybrid column compression, uh, you know, obviously the, the, the list is, uh, you know, is very long. Um, all of these features are able to be utilized in a clone that has been created with Exadata Sparse clones. I've mentioned a few times now they're space efficient. We're only copying the data across that is being changed in the clone itself from the parent. Uh, and I can do uh, what's uh, called in the documentation and, and what we call in the, uh, in the slides here, a range of data timeline. Basically what that means is I can feed it from production using DataGuard. So I can have a, and, and we'll walk through this as part of the demonstration, I can create snapshots at given intervals of my disaster recovery or of a data guard database, maybe not DR itself, and in fact, probably best not to use DR itself, best to use a secondary standby database. Uh, but I can create these, uh, these snapshots of that standby database and then create read-write clones off that test parent so that I have a point in time where the data is consistent. Maybe that's useful for things like production support or point, uh, point in time reporting uh, in a, uh, in a non-production style environment. Uh, I can create space efficient backups with uh, sparse as well. So RMN is fully cognizant of the sparse structure uh, and, cre and can create sparse backups uh, and use the backups of the parent uh, to, uh, to be very space efficient in that, uh, in that regard. Uh, and I, because these are fully functioning databases, I can also uh, use things like Oracle Data Masking, Subsetting, Data Redaction, Virtual Private Database, uh, you know, a whole range of other uh, techniques to do data obfuscation and keep data secure as it's moving from a production environment into a non-production environment. How you use these, what's the, you know, the most appropriate in your environment, uh, that's a much bigger conversation, but these are all possible uh, inside uh, inside Exadata Sparse Clients. So, the very first thing that we need to be aware of with Exadata Sparse Clients is I have to have a read-only test parent. Um, it is the root of everything inside the Exadata Sparse environment. And what you see here on the right-hand side is a slightly stylized uh, environment. I have a database, uh, PARDB, my, my test parent, which is a read-only copy of production. I've cloned this somehow, maybe I've done an RMN duplicate, maybe as we'll see a little later on, I'm using uh, Oracle Data Guard to create a standby database, but I've created a clone of my production database somehow on my data disk group in a non-production environment. And I have a sparse disk group underneath that at the moment, it's completely empty, but that's where I'm gonna be creating my clones. Now, Exodus Sparse Clones support all the different deployment options for Oracle Database. The non-CDB architecture, which is obviously now uh, deprecated in, uh, and de-supported actually, sorry, in Database 21C, deprecated in 19C. Um, pluggable databases by themselves, and we'll talk about that uh, in a little bit of detail later on, uh, or CDBs and all of its PDBs. So working on the CDB as the container, as the name implies, of all of those databases, those pluggable databases are uh, that reside uh, inside that. So regardless of your deployment choice and the granularity you want to work at, uh, Exadata Sparse Clones uh, supports that, uh, those choices. So once we have our production database cloned on the data disk group, I might want to create a sparse clone that I'm going to call MainDB. I'm just going to, for a minute, kind of think about in a development style environment, I might want to have a, uh, a uh, a, a main code line. Think of this main DB as, as my current main code line. I then may want to create nightly builds off that, and, but have that main database uh, acting as the central, uh, you know, uh, the truth, so to speak, of my database at that point in time. I'm gonna be testing my nightly builds against that set of data on a regular basis. So I might create uh, another clone of my main DB, which I'm going to have as read write, so that I, Alex Blythe, can do some bug fixing. Maybe I've got a, uh, a gnarly production problem uh, that I need to do some work on, uh, or maybe, um, you know, maybe I'm doing a feature or something like that. Anyway, 
I'm going to create a hierarchy of databases of clones so that I can satisfy all of these different uh, these different requirements. Whether that's uh, you know uh, testing builds, whether it's doing bug fixes, uh, or whether it's some super secret project, the SSPDB, um, the super secret project database. I'm going to create this so that I have a second code line when maybe I'm doing some some pretty significant changes to maybe the schema. Uh, the way the data is being represented, uh, the application code itself as well. I could be doing a lot of change and I want to keep these two streams of, uh, of effort up to date as far as the data goes, but divergent in the application testing and so forth. So I can have this hierarchy, as I've said, now I'm going to create, or rather Gavin is going to create a feature enhancement, Gavin Parrish that is. Uh, he's going to do some work on the main DB, uh, whereas I've been asked to do some work on the Super SQL project. Uh, so I can create these this hierarchy of clones to satisfy all of these different requirements in, say, a development style environment. Now, be aware of the recommendation on the bottom left hand side. The recommended snapshot tree depth or length of the chain, I tend to call it a chain. Uh, if you think about the way or if you look at the way this is, uh, this is structured, it looks a little bit like a chain. Uh, if you go from A, B, bug fix on the bottom right hand, uh, sorry, bottom left hand side of the graphic to main DB, back to par DB, it's a chain in my mind. So that chain should not exceed in any direction more than 10 snapshots for performance reasons. There's no technical limitation beyond that, but in testing that we've done, we've seen uh, you know, a degradation in performance once you get past that 10 snapshot, uh, that snapshot level. So just bear that, uh, that in mind as well. And maybe that means you need to have a few different um, production clones uh, at different points in time that enables you to do uh, different testing on different data sets uh, throughout that life cycle. Speaking of different points of time to do testing, one of the key features that sparse, uh, Exadata sparse clones or snapshots also supports is the ability, because of this hierarchical uh, scenario we just walked through a second ago, use our data guard standby to enable snapshots at a point in time being fed from production. And as I said earlier on, we can create a standby database specifically for the purposes of being a test parent. Obviously, we want to keep our true disaster recovery database uh, separate uh, and not uh, impacted or compromised by having all of these standby databases that developers are using, or rather the other way around. If we have to go to disaster recovery, we don't want to necessarily impact all of our developers and have to uh, you know, destroy all of those, uh, catch up our standby database and then carry, uh, carry forward. We want to keep these two functions separate. Keep disaster recovery as disaster recovery, but we can use the standby features to create uh, these snapshots in time that enable that hierarchy of clones that we just uh, talked about a second ago uh, to create uh, or to sorry to map to your database development or your application development uh, lifecycle as you need to. Same recommendation: keep uh, keep the chain or the depth of the tree uh, to ten or less. Uh, fewer is always uh, you know better in this case. Um, but the basic steps of doing of creating a sparse standby. And the sparse standby is this top layer uh, that is pointing back to the test parent there, is to stop read or apply. You can stop the, the standby database if you want, but uh, you know, stop, uh, stop read or apply. Uh, change the ACLs in ASM for the current standby redo files. Uh, sorry, current standby data files, not the redo files, just the data files. Now they may be already a sparse clone and maybe on the sparse uh, on a sparse disk group, but it's the current data files that we have to make read only, and this is so that we have that read only uh, point to go back to if the next layer of uh, of the hierarchy requires an I/O back to an unmaterialized block. We're then going to create the sparse standby data files and update the control file, and we'll see this in the demonstration. We can then restart the standby database and restart uh, read or apply. And then we can just cycle through that as often, as often as you need to. Again, remembering our 10 sparse database chain recommendation. But each of those uh, artifacts that we've left behind, the test parent, the original full copy of standby that was created as a test parent, and then the sparse test parents created at you know almost midnight every night, as you can see in the graphic, each of those then becomes a sparse test parent that we can create more sparse clones of. 
All right, so let's let's dig into this life cycle a little bit further. I've, I've rushed through it in the last slide, uh, but let's make it hopefully a little bit more concrete. Uh, and then when the demonstration, hopefully we'll set this idea. So to get started with Xdata Sparse Standbys, this is using a standby database as the test parent and taking snapshots on a regular basis. We need to start with a standby database. And that needs to be a fully instantiated or fully materialized copy of production. It's a standby database after all, uh, but it has to live in our, uh, in our data disk group. It has to be a, a, a full database clone. So future sparse test parents can be created or, or will be created in the sparse disk group. Not can, but they will be. They need to be there uh, to invoke the code uh, that Xdata sparse clones requires. Uh, but once we have this initial setup on the left-hand side, our primary production database, our disaster recovery database on another infrastructure completely uh, separate from our testing function. Uh, but a test parent, which is also a standby database, we can then do that first iteration of stopping the data guard read or apply, stopping the, the standby database as well if you want to, but uh, at the very least stopping uh, read or apply, setting the ACLs for the test parent, that is uh, the database, I'll just use my mouse to highlight that, that's uh, setting these data files here to read only, uh, and then creating the sparse data files represented here on the far right hand side and updating the control file. Now there's a special function that does that piece of work, creates the sparse data files and updates the control files. And we'll see that in action uh, in a few minutes. And then we restart, uh, restart uh, read or apply. And as you can see in the graphic, the standby database has simply gained new files. It, it understands there are new files that it's writing changes to, and those files understand that anything below that or anything that's required outside those changes is going to be contained in the read-only test parent uh, in the middle of the DR database in the sparse standby uh, on the right-hand side. So there's these linkages created between the, different, uh, between the different data files. To create a snapshot, once I have that first iteration uh, run, I can then create snapshots uh, like the Joe snapshot, the Mary snapshot, for whatever work those two uh, individuals are doing work on at that point in time from the test parent, so long as it's read only. And this is you know, the, the key point of difference between uh, Sparse and ACFS, as you'll see later on. A test parent must be read only. It cannot, cannot have changes being made to it at the time because it becomes uh, a link in that chain. So Joe's snapshot and Mary's snapshot, they can be read-write. We can do work in both of those. We could then turn those into read-only uh, databases if we want to and create snapshots of those. Maybe we've done that data masking we talked about before, some data obfuscation, uh, made it a secure uh, data environment, um, and then we create uh, development environments off that. Uh, so we create these hierarchies in that, uh, in that way. And here's an example of that. So now I've done another iteration. So I have my test parent, uh, my full standby test parent, created some snapshots for Joe and Mary. I've done a, uh, an iteration of creating a sparse standby. Uh, I've created um, some snapshots off that uh, on Monday. Joe's got a second snapshot for you know, uh, some work he's done. We've then created Irina snapshots so that she can do some, uh, some uh, destructive testing of the work that Joe has done in his snapshot. And all of these, as you can see, they point back. So Irene's snapshot points back to Joe's snapshot too which points back to the sparse parent above that, and then ultimately back to that test parent. So you can see that chain idea or the depth of tree uh, starting to emerge there. If we take that even further, and again, this is going into that, uh, that length of uh, 10 uh, snapshots in a, uh, in a chain, you can see how this could start growing out over time. And maybe uh, on Tuesday, you're creating Joe another snapshot and Irene another snapshot, both of those are read-write follow that through until Friday. Uh, and then we have this situation where we could have a number of different uh, hierarchies and uh, requirements being built out, ultimately with this chain of, uh, of snapshots that forms our standby database in totality. And then if we require, or once we've reached that, uh, that 10 limit, we can undo all of this. And what I mean by that is we need to remove all of these snapshots and then we can refresh our standby whether that's using RMAN uh, and dragging the whole standby forward, whether that's maybe that's creating another standby database. Remember, DataGuard uh, is able to support 
uh, directly from the primary up to 30 standby databases. So maybe I'm going to create another standby database and start a whole new set of chains uh, of, uh, of uh, these sparse clone environments and sparse standbys. And then I'm going to unwind all of this other environment so that I'm, I'm only ever keeping uh, the bare minimum of information, sorry, bare minimum of database change in the environment uh, representing all of these different, uh, these different snapshots uh, or clones. So let's let's try and make this a little bit more concrete. Let's go through a bit of a demonstration. Um, these are going to be relatively quick. They're screen recordings, and I've, I've taken out a, a, a fair bit of the wait time, starting up instances and shutting down instances. I'm sure we've all done more than our fair share of those uh, over the years, so I hopefully won't uh, bore you with any of those things. Um, but uh, let's go through a bit of a demo. But first, let's just do a little bit of setup. So. Um, I am creating, or have created rather, in the environment that I recorded these from, uh, a primary database called ALB19PRI. It's a read-write primary production style database. You know, this is where my application is writing to. Uh, it's sitting on a data disk group somewhere on an exadata in, uh, in uh, the development uh, labs. Off that, I've created a data guard standby database called ALB19 underscore STB. Now, obviously, both of these have the same database name internally, but their instances and their global names uh, are going to be different. It's also sitting on a data disk group. Now, I'm, I'm pointing this out very explicitly because that means they are fully materialized databases. Every block is fully materialized. It's fully formatted. It's, uh, you know, it, it looks and feels just like every Oracle database that you're probably familiar with using out there uh, today. Uh, it's also using Active Data Guard. Uh, it's using uh, sorry uh, appliers on. It's open read only. Now you could do this without using data guard. Have apply on, but uh, leave the database in mount state. That's entirely possible as well. Uh, I just happen to be using data uh, sorry active data guard um, because it uh, you know, hopefully that's what everyone out there in the uh, uh, in the real world is using as well to make sure that they can use these standby databases to their full effect. Now what we're going to see in the screen. Uh, demo in just a second is this first iteration of creating a sparse standby. We're going to see uh, read or apply turned off. We're going to create some files that we'll have a look at in a little bit of detail uh, in the demonstration, namely changing the ACLs for the parent uh, data files, and then the function that creates the sparse data files that's represented by uh, the slightly transparent graphic on the right hand side and also updates the control file. Now these are going to be created in the sparse DG, so SPRC1 disk group. Uh, and again, that's so that the Exadata platform knows to invoke that special uh, sparse uh, code. All right, so here we are in our, uh, in our demo environment. And what I'm doing here is I'm shutting down redo apply. Let me just pause that for a second here and we'll explain this for a second. So uh, what I've done straight out of the gate is I've invoked data guard broker and I've edited the properties for my standby database, so LB19 underscore STB, and I've turned read or apply off. That's all that step is doing. I know you can't see the command uh, in the screen grab here, but that's what I've done in the background. The next two things I'm doing is creating some scripts that we'll use, and I'll show you the contents of these in a couple of seconds uh, as part of the recording. One is uh, what I'm calling the create rename script in inverted commas, and then I'm creating uh, some SQL that I'm going to execute in ASM. Let me talk about that one first, slightly out of order in, time, in terms of the screen grab, but uh, that's probably, uh, that is the first step that we're going to see. Uh, so what I need to do, I keep talking about these, these test parents being read only and having to update AC, uh, ACLs inside ASM. So this create ASM SQL script is doing exactly that. It's, it's, it's a dynamic piece of SQL that is uh, going to um, create alter uh, disk script statements that we execute in ASM and they set the file permissions for the data files that the standby database currently knows about on the data disk group to read only. And that's a really important step in the way that the sparse, uh, the sparse uh, environment works. I keep talking about having to have read only sparse test parents or sparse um, sorry, or read-only test parents. This is a way of guaranteeing that they are truly read-only. Yes, we could start the instances uh, read-only, but this is an extra protection mechanism built into ASM that we leverage to ensure that 
uh, regardless of how you interact with the file, that it's a read-only file. The first create script there that I'm, uh, that I'm generating is the rename script. Now this is uh, named, it's called rename in the function, uh, as we'll see in a, uh, in a little bit of time. Uh, but what it's doing is it's actually creating, not renaming in the first instance, it's creating a sparse file on the sparse disk group. It's then pointing that sparse file back to its parent, in this case on the data disk group. And then it is updating the control file. And this is where the rename part really kind of comes in. It's renaming the existing data files in the control file with the new data files that are now on the sparse disk group. So the name is slightly, uh, slightly uh, difficult to parse if you don't understand that it's doing those steps uh, in totality. Create the sparse data files, link them to the previous parent, and then uh, update the control file, rename uh, the files in the control file. So we'll just keep the, uh, the demo moving on. So what we're going to do now is we're going to shut down that standby database and we're going to execute the ASM SQL script. So here you can see, there we go, alter disk root data C1, set permission, owner equals read only, group equals read only, very simple to Linux uh, in that regard, uh, other equals none for file. And here is the important piece of information to note for this iteration of the demonstration. The data files that we're updating are in the data disk group. So for uh, this undo table space data file, data c1 slash alb19 underscore stb data file, undo tbs and the rest of the omf name. And you can see that happening for all of the data files, not just in the cdb, but in the pdbs inside this. Now I've only got a seed and I've got one actual pdb, but I have to set read only for all of those data files. So just bear that in mind. We'll continue on here. So that will all get executed inside ASM uh, in just a second. There we go. And now we're going to restart the data guard instance in mount mode so that we can run the next script. And this is the, this is the script or the, uh, the function that really does create the sparse clone itself. So as you can see, the function is in the DBMS DNFS uh, package. The procedure is called clone db underscore rename file. That's where I've, I've taken the, uh, the name rename script from and it has two parameters one is the current data file name i'm just going to use the system data file here uh, that's easy to read uh, so the current file name is data c1 alb19 stb uh, the pdb guid slash data file and here you can see we're talking about the system data file the second parameter is what is the new sparse data file going to be called what's going to be created in the sparse disk group so you can see that I've passed in the sparse disk group, SPRSC1. The file structure is going to be the same up until the point where we get to the OMF name. And here I'm telling the database what the file name is going to be called. So I can't use the same, the exact same OMF, uh, OMF uh, structure. I can't use uh, in particular the, uh, the period. So I've converted all the periods to underscores. And then I've appended something just to help me make it more unique in my environment. So T0 this is my time zero snapshot uh, of this particular file. So this script is gonna, as I said before, it's gonna create this file in the sparse disk group. It's gonna create a link from the sparse disk group uh, file back to its parent in the data disk group. And then it's gonna update the control file with that information as well. So we'll kick that off and we'll see a bit more of this uh, executing in just a second. So this is executed inside the standby database. Turning standby file management back on, I turned that off earlier on, forgot to mention that, uh, didn't have that being output into the script. And then I'm going back into DataGuard Broker and I've re-enabled Redo Apply and now I'm gonna restart the database. And what that brings us to is this portion of the demo or the next step in the demo. So I've now done that first iteration. In fact, I'll just go back to that briefly so you can see where we're at. This is what we've created now. I've got a primary database I've created this snapshot, uh, sorry, this sparse files. I now therefore have a snapshot as a read-only test parent. Happens to be my original standby database um, uh, in, in all its materialized glory, but it is now a test parent. I can use that to create further clients. In this next iteration, I'm gonna do exactly the same thing again, but now I'm gonna create this new set of files. So I'm gonna have sparse files, 
pointed back at sparse files, pointed back at regular data files on my data disk group, each of which is going to be read only, as you can see. My, my test parent that's currently read only is going to stay that way. The files I just created in the last portion of the demonstration are going to become read only. And then I'm going to have my active data guard read only data files. So they're going to be writable from data guard, but they're going to be read only as far as uh, doing any reporting. I'm going to be using that, um, uh, that read only mechanism that uh, Active Data Guard provides. So we'll jump into this portion of the demo. It's exactly the same script. You're going to see pretty much the same thing, but we will pause in a couple of locations. You can see, hopefully, uh, some of the differences here. So we'll stop read to apply. Uh, as we said, uh, as I said in the last demonstration, we're going to recreate these new scripts because now I've got different, um, different file names. In fact, let me just pause here. We can have a look at that. So now I'm setting the files I created in the last section of the demonstration read only. All the descript sparse uh, SPRSC1, set permission read only, group read only. Uh, but importantly, you can see here this, uh, this table space. Um, in fact, I think it was actually this one down here that we uh, looked at earlier on. Um, this undo table space with the T0 extension, that's now what I'm going to uh, um, change permissions to read only so that I can no longer make changes to that I can use it as a test parent. And you can see here all of the data files are, are listed there. I'm just trying to be consistent, obviously, in the uh, in the files we've been interrogating. So let me just restart this. All right, so let me just restart this. And we'll execute all of those. We're going to restart data guard in mount again. We're going to run our rename script. Let me just pause that again briefly so you can see what's going on here. You can see now that the input file is the sparse file to our T0 instance. And now I'm creating new sparse files in the same directory with the same name, but I'm appending yet another set of characters to the end of that. I'm adding T1 to it. So this is my time one uh, iteration of this particular script. So I'm building out this hierarchy both in name, but more importantly in the structure that the, that the Exadata system represents. Restart that again. And we'll let this run through. So there's all my disk groups being altered. They're now read only. I'm now creating my sparse disk groups. Sorry, there. There we sorry. Creating my sparse data files. There they go. Uh, turning standby file management back on and restarting read to apply. And I've stopped and started the database here to uh, turn it read only again as well. So that brings us back to, you know, to where we are here. We've now got a primary database, uh, an original test parent in all its materialized glory. Like I said, full clone of the database. I have a read-only test parent that was created from a snapshot, and now I have these read-only data files, uh, sorry, read-only active data guard data files. They're read-write the ASM level. Read to apply is writing to those files, uh, but they're read-only from the instances perspective. I'm opening them up read-only, but read to apply is on. Which brings us now to the last part of the demonstration, and that's to create a clone that I'm gonna call new db underscore clone, CLN, it's a global name, off that first iteration of my uh, standby database. So I'm going to create a sparse clone from a sparse test parent that talks back to the original data files uh, for any of the information that might uh, require. Now it's going to be a read-write clone. It's going to not be being fed from data guard once it's been created. It's you know off on its own merry journey as far as the internal data goes and what you might use for it, you know, use it for rather. I said you could use it for, uh, for development, uh, you know, whatever the use case is, um, you know, it's a, uh, it's a regular Oracle database at this point. It just happens to be space efficient and pointing back to a sparse test parent, talking back to, uh, to that fully materialized uh, original standby database set of data files. So let's run through this as well. Now this script is slightly different because it's doing a, for, a, a few other bits and pieces. And I've also done a little bit of prep work. I've also already uh, created Inodora parameter file. I've already copied passwords uh, into the relevant locations in database homes. Uh, I copy those uh, into ASM uh, as part of the script. Um, you probably also, if you're working on cloud custom or cloud service, uh, or if you're using TDD, uh, TDE on premises, you'd need to make sure that you're aware of um, the requirements around uh, the TDE wallets. Um, but there's, so there's, you know, a few things that you might need to be aware of, but the process is basically the same uh, as what we've just seen in the uh, previous portions of the demonstration. 
So let's go through this and I'll uh, annotate these a little bit more as we go along. So I'll up an instance and like I said, I've created the error parameter file already for that. So that's something you're gonna to need to do ahead of time. More importantly, I've created a script that uh, is gonna create a new control file, which is what you're seeing on the screen at the moment. Now, I've, take, I've created this script in the test parent itself as part of that previous script. It just wasn't something that I highlighted uh, or had visible as part of that script. But I'm just using a bit of SQL to create this. It's pretty, uh, it's relatively straightforward. Um, you know, and uh, really is just fed off the dollar data file uh, if you're looking to replicate something like this. Um, and I'm using uh, a, a backup control file to trace as a, as a template for that uh, if you want to copy this uh, in, at your leisure. But the important part of this is what's highlighted in red here. I have to input as part of the data files what data files I want to act as the parent. And you'll see here that I'm using the T0 data files as the parent. I'm not using the ones on data, I'm not using the original data files, I'm using T, the T0 files as the parent in this particular instance. Now the control file needs to know where those files are so that when you do the rename portion of the, uh, of the script and it creates the new sparse files, the control file can be updated to say, okay, this file is now related to this new sparse file. So that's the importance of having the control file point to the to the uh, the files that are being used as the parent. All right, so let's continue this on. And we've created a similar rename script as we did before. And we can see here that uh, we're inputting the parent name as T0, and I'm creating new sparse files. I'm using the T1 uh, suffix, but notice here that I've changed the database directory structure. So now I'm creating them as new DB. So I, I personally like to have this, you know, this um, uh, this suffix kind of structure, so I can work out where in the chain a clone lives, and I'm using T0 as a, you know, as a way of doing that. Obviously, you can name them however you choose to. Uh, but in this particular inca um, uh, invocation of the, of the script, notice that I've changed the directory structure from ALB19 underscore SDB to new DB because I'm creating a new database. It's a new clone. It's not related to my, star to my sparse instance. I want to have it in a different directory structure. And that's ultimately the, the way that I've, uh, I've chosen to, uh, to do that and make that uh, obvious inside ASM and the control files. So let's keep this going. There's our script, so we're running that inside the database. So we ran that uh, the control file before. I'm now copying the p file, um, sorry, the sp file, or creating the sp file rather from the p file into ASM. I'm just going to back that up a smidge because that's gone just a bit faster than uh, I anticipated. So I'm creating the sp file from the current p file. Now again, I created that p file earlier on. This happens to be the location here. The main thing that you want to know about that p-file though is that uh, the database name is different, obviously the global name is different as well, from the original database name. So it's, it's now di being disassociated in its identity, but not in its data file structure or data, data file linkage from its parent. But because this is going to be a rack database, we're running on Exadata, I'm going to create that sp-file, I'm going to put that inside ASM. Now notice that I've put this inside the data disk group. Now it's important to point this out because it's worthwhile uh, mentioning that data files really are the only structure that should go inside the sparse disk group. Things like p-files, password files, redo logs, um, archive redo logs, those kind of files are really still off better in data and reco because they're not they're not pointing back at something else. They're not a space efficient file in of themselves. They, they hold data that is being used uh, and being manipulated um, uh, in an ongoing basis. You know, read a log file, we fill that up, we archive that off, uh, you know, we put that into the recode disk script, and then we reuse that file. It's not ever being pointed back to another file. I mean, there's no requirement or linkage between these files that's required. So just bear that in mind that those kind of files are better off in data and reco. The data files are really the only thing that needs to, uh, to live inside the sparse disk group. Temp files as well, 
better in data, um, just simply because you've got more space there, and we're not, you know, we're not creating sparse temp files. They're already sparse in a way anyway because they're temp files. Whatever's inside them, we've already told the database we don't care if that data file is lost. It had temp data in it anyway. The next thing I'm doing, and you might have seen this in the control file, is that uh, I'm doing an author database open reset logs. Like I said a minute ago, we are changing the identity of this clone so it's now its own, uh, it has its own identity. It's now the new DB as opposed to being part of the ALB uh, database um, uh, hierarchy uh, from a, an identity perspective. Again, we're still linking these data files together. They, are, they do have a relationship, but as far as this database is concerned, it's its own database going forward uh, from the database in. Uh, it's a CDB and has one PDB inside that, so I'm also opening, uh, once I've done the author database open reset logs, uh, I'm jumping in both the CDB and in the PDB and I'm adding a temp file because they aren't created as part of that control file um, uh, update that we saw earlier on. Uh, so it allows me to do, um, you know, to do uh, temp style operations. And we have our clone effectively at this point. What I'm doing now in the rest of this is really just all the hygiene that goes into making sure that you can control this with server control. Um, so I'm shutting down the database. I'm now, I've added this into server control. I've done uh, SIVCTEL, uh, add database, add instance uh, operations. Uh, I've restarted the database on one instance only uh, and altered the cluster database parameter to true. It was false previously. Uh, and then I've restarted the database with server control on the two instances in my environment. And then finally, I'm just running the script here to, to load the environment variables. I've got some aliases there, so new db underscore cln is my new database. I'm just going to jump into SQL Plus and have a, have a look at a couple of things here. First being, I'm just going to do a, a select open mode for my clone. And we'll see here that this is a read-write database. There we go. And then we're just going to have a quick look at the dollar data file as well. And so we can see uh, what's going on from, uh, from that perspective. And you'll see here... Uh, and that's the end of the uh, of, of the recording anyway. But you can see here that my data files are in that new DB directory structure inside ASM, and they happen to have the T0, T1 suffix, like I said before, but really what's differentiating them from an ASM perspective and from the database's understanding of where its data files are is it's point pointing to these new DB, uh, the files, sorry, in the new DB directory structure inside ASM. And each of these are then related back to its test parent, which is then related back to its test parent, which happens to be on the data disk group in this particular instance. And so at the end of our demo, we've created this structure. We have a read-write primary database on another exadata infrastructure somewhere inside the development labs. We had a standby database that was being fed from that. We created a sparse, um, uh, a new set of sparse data files and redirected data guard apply to that. And in fact, all we had to do to do that was rename the data files and solve the control file. We didn't do anything with the instance. We didn't change anything in terms of the way that data guard is configured. We just simply told the control file it had to write to new data files. We then did that whole operation again, created a new set of data files. This could have been, you know, an hour apart, five hours apart, two days apart. You know, the time frame is entirely up to you. Um, created a new set of sparse data files where read or apply is being written to. Uh, and then we created a read-write clone from that first iteration of the run. So we have a clone, a read-write clone, um, that is related back to this set of sparse data files, but is a completely independent database as far as its own identity goes. It's not called ALB19, it's called NewDB. It can have you know, a completely different set of uh, schema modifications made to at this point. Maybe this is where you want to do that data obfuscation that I talked about really early on in the piece. Um, it's, a, it's a separate database, but it is related back through these linkages inside the Exadata storage software through the data files themselves uh, so that it understands where to get any blocks from, ultimately from this fully materialized client back on the data disk group that we created as part of the standby database originally. So hopefully that makes uh, Exadata storage snapshots uh, or Exadata uh, clones a little bit more concrete for you. Uh, I know those demonstrations were relatively quick, not lots of details in terms of the execution, but the, hopefully the two main scripts that, you're, uh, that you need to be aware of were, uh, were relatively clear. 
The documentation is pretty good. There's some resources uh, at the end of the presentation um, that talk a bit more about all of these uh, that myself and uh, some colleagues have uh, worked on over the last uh, 12 months or so. Um, but with that, I'm going to park Exadata Snapshots just for a moment, and we're going to talk about ACFS Snapshots very briefly. Now, I don't have a demo because I know we're running uh, short on time already at this point. The other option we talked about early on in the piece was ACFS Snapshots. Now, again, this is a file system level snapshot of a database that is inside ACFS. And therein lies one of the key differences between Exadata Sparse clones and ACFS snapshots. My database has to be in ACFS if I want to use ACFS snapshots. If I want to use sparse clones, my database has to be on ASM. No two, I can't mix the two together. I can't have a database on a, uh, in an ASM disk group in data or RICO, in data really, you wouldn't put it in RICO, uh, and create an ACFS snapshot. Uh, those two, we can't mix and match them that way. They, the, the, the parent always has to be inside the technology you want to use. I can just as I uh, as I did in the Exadata storage uh, snapshot world, I can create uh, a hierarchy of snapshots. So parents of you know um, sorry snapshots of snapshots. I can uh, you know do the same kind of functionality that I just showed you a moment ago with DataGuard uh, and create um, parents that have DataGuard feeds, which allows me to create that you know that timeline of data changes in a similar fashion to uh, to the Exadata snapshots. I can support a lot more snapshots per file system, however, with ACFS. And this is one of the other key differentiators uh, between ACFS and Exadata snapshots. If you need you know, up to 1,023 snapshots for, per file system, or rather, if you need more than 10 snapshots per database, this might be a technology that you should investigate further depending on the use case. But notice the last point. I know I've jumped over data obfuscation because that, you know, it's the same across both technologies here, but the last point to do with Exadata, uh, sorry, ACFS snapshots and Exadata, is that the ACFS snapshot, or ACFS generally, does not support the majority of the Exadata features, performance features. It does support HCC, I know that's not listed on there, I can have HCC on, uh, on ACFS, but really the performance features that happen inside the Exadata storage software are going to be limited to uh, smart flash cache only. So buffering of I.O. In, in the flash cache uh, for ACFS. Storage indexes are not applicable. Offload is not applicable. Quarantine is not applicable. All of those kind of features that we mentioned very briefly earlier on do not apply to ACFS file systems on Exadata or to the snapshots, ACFS snapshots on Exadata. So if you have a requirement that requires Exadata performance features, or you're trying to you know, understand how storage, impact, uh, storage indexes, for instance, impact or don't impact a, a workload, storage offload impacts or doesn't impact a workload, uh, persistent memory, um, the flash cache, all of the flash cache features. Uh, Exadata uh, sparse clones is a technology you're gonna be wanting to focus on in that regard. If, however, you just need a lot of databases, space efficient databases for non-functional testing. Maybe this is your lowest level of development environment. ACFS snapshots and Xdata is probably a really good technology for you to investigate because you're not reliant on, or not, uh, not trying to rely on those Xdata features that I mentioned just a moment ago. So you can do both on the same platform. You just can't mix them together in the same database and, and try to get the best of both worlds is all I'm trying to get out there. So let's just go through this. Um, it's a bit more of a paper demo, this one, than, uh, than the previous one. Um, but ultimately, I'm going to start with uh, that same premise. I've got a standby database it's sitting on ACFS. It's being, um, I have uh, that redo coming from a, uh, from a primary database on another Exadata somewhere. That could be on ASM, probably is on ASM. But this standby database, represented on that red line there, is sitting inside ASM. Sorry, it's sitting inside ACFS. So I'm going to create that standby on ACFS, and that's what the red line is really indicating there. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to stop read or apply, and I'm going to create a read only ACFS snapshot at the base of this. Now, this is somewhat common between both ACFS snapshots and Exadata uh, sparse clones. I have to have a read only um, base layer or, or test parent. Where ACFS diverges slightly in terms of its conceptual uh, implementation is 
everything below that first read-only layer can then be read-write. So as you can see in the graphic, I've created that first read-only snapshot. Let me just highlight that quickly here. But you'll notice that I have a read-write database pointing to a read-write database. Oh, sorry, a read-write snapshot pointing to a read-write snapshot that ultimately then reports, uh, reads, uh, points back to that read-only snapshot. So I can have more flexibility as far as read-write databases go in ACFS than I can with Xdata Sparse clients. And then I've already kind of jumped to that last point. I can create additional read-write or read-only ACFS snapshots as required for those different test cases. And then I can continue to do that same step. So at time one, I might do the same thing. I might, uh, you know, as, as DataGuard uh, is being streamed in, maybe it's midnight again uh, on the next night, I create a new read-only uh, ACFS snapshot, I've stopped read or apply, create that uh, snapshot as the base and then restart read or apply and then I can create more databases again after that. And I can just keep doing that over and over and over again. And then ACFS is going to be doing the work of copying blocks from the source, the source being up here in the data guard world, to the read only, uh, the read only bases or test parents uh, and then to any of those uh, subsequent snapshots underneath that. Uh, as it's required from that file system perspective. So like I said, a bit more of a paper demonstration this time around, but the concept is very similar. Um, but just be, uh, just be mindful of the differences between the two technologies. Now, didn't I say something about PDBs all the way back at the start of the session? You're absolutely right, I did. Everything we've talked about today is applicable to both the PDBs, the CDBs and all of the PDBs inside that, or as I said really early on, if you're not in the, in the multi-tenant architecture at the moment, you're still in the non-CDB architecture, it's applicable to all of that as well. So it gets slightly more user-friendly inside a PDB, however, inside the CDB when we're cloning, um, uh, cloning PDBs inside Sparse or ACFS. Ultimately, I still have to have my parent, uh, my test parent, my very original test parent on a data disk group if I'm using Sparse, or I have to have the whole CDB uh, inside ACFS if I'm using ACFS snapshot copies. Um, but however, all I need to do is change the database to be read-only, and that's a SQL command, all the pluggable database open read-only. I don't have to do all that ACL setting that I showed you in the demonstration. And then I just use a create pluggable database clone from source, create file destination sparse in this particular example for uh, up the top there, and use the keyword snapshot copy. And that's going to instruct the database to instruct Exadata to create new sparse files in the sparse disk group on the right hand side at the top there. And it will handle all the read only and read write uh, ACLs. For ACFS, the same happens. Those same commands with an extra clause that invokes clone DB will go and create the ACFS snapshot underneath the covers. Uh, so it becomes a lot more integrated when we're just working with PDBs. But I know a lot of organizations, a lot of customers are in uh, you know, a state of uh, migration, uh, many to Oracle Database 19C, uh, but many are also moving you know, at, at various points in time into that multi-tenant architecture for non, uh, from non-CDB architecture. Uh, so just to summarize, uh, given that we're probably well over time at this point, um, the reason I think for, you know, for creating snapshots is pretty clear. We, uh, many organizations have Exadata in production, disaster recovery, uh, many have them in dev test as well, uh, or are leveraging disaster recovery infrastructure for dev test. Um, and are therefore tr you know, have a single platform for all of these use cases, production, disaster recovery, dev test. And ultimately they you know, believe and understand that the best place to run Oracle Database is an Exadata platform. Whether that's on-premises, cloud customer, cloud service, or autonomous, the best place to run an Oracle Database is on Exadata. And depending on your particular environment, you may have requirements for many non-production databases, uh, and therefore you need to have space-efficient uh, space cloning capabilities. And hopefully what you've seen today is both the Exadata sparse uh, technology and ACFS snapshots on Exadata uh, in action to varying degrees, but understand that these two technologies are, uh, are available on the Exadata platform so that you can create these space efficient clones, database clones, to suit your requirements, 
to be able to have them fed from production, having up-to-date information is what I mean by that, uh, that phrase, um, so that you can, you, know, you can meet the requirements of your organization for non-production, keeping space consumption relatively low and, uh, and uh, under control, I guess, in sometimes uh, a finite uh, style environment. Um, but integrate that in with things like standby database to be able to create, like I said before, uh, clones of a database that are being fed from production, having up-to-date information, uh, having a hierarchy of clones, um, being able to choose uh, which is the right technology for different parts of a use case. Maybe low-level development is better on ACFS, using ACFS snapshots, uh, and when you get into things like system integration testing, pre-prod performance testing, UAT, maybe they go on Exadata Sparse, where you can start leveraging all of the Exadata capabilities as well. So you have access to all of these, and you have access, obviously, to the non-space-efficient uh, technologies, ARM and duplicate, uh, export-import, PDB hot client, those kind of things without the snapshot copy clause. Uh, lots of different ways of creating clients uh, when it comes down to it. Before I say thank you, I uh, just wanted to put a couple of resources here for you to have a look at. Um, there's a, a much longer version of uh, most of this presentation up on oracle.com, uh, but covering both Exadata Sparse snapshots as well as ACFS, uh, despite the PDF name not reflecting that, uh, it does include a lot on ACFS snapshots. Um, I have, and, and with a colleague of mine, uh, we've written a, a few blogs here. This is a, a couple we're working on a few more in the background as well. Um, but there's a long conversation on uh, PDB sparse cloning uh, on Exadata, uh, Exadata sparse standby, which is what the bulk of the demonstration was, and also on ACFS snapshots, uh, as well as obviously a link to the documentation there. That's always useful to have. And with that, I'd like to say thank you very much for your time. Really appreciate your attention. Uh, please be in touch with me. As I said right at the very start, there's a number of ways of getting uh, getting in contact with myself uh, or Gavin uh, or Seth, uh, the other uh, members of my team. Uh, very happy to take questions uh, through those uh, through those channels. All right, thanks a lot for your time. Appreciate it.